All right, so we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. So if you guys have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 9 for me, please. If you guys have a freeway Bible, if someone wants to yell at the number, the page number. Are we good there? Luke chapter 9, verses 57. Why is there no radio? 62. 714, if you've got a freeway Bible. Tonight we're going to be talking about what it takes to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. And that's the title of my message tonight, is what it takes to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. So, if you guys are there, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into it and we'll get started. If you guys don't mind bowing with me. Lord, I just thank you, God, just for Freeway. Thank you, God, for this ministry and what you have done with this ministry, where you've brought... Uh, the people, how you brought people out of bondage to this ministry, God, just from hearing your truth and hearing your word. God, there's people in this room tonight that I believe that need to be committed to you. There's people in this room tonight that I believe, God, that have been backsliding, that think this is a game, that needs you, God. The people in, the, in this room that are hurting, I pray for them right now, Lord, and I pray that your word throughout this night will be able to reach them, reveal to them who you really are and what your truth is and what your word of God says and how you're uh, what you've done to save us. God, and I pray that it would just pierce their hearts. I pray that your spirit would be evident in this place tonight, God. I pray that you would bind every wicked demon and uh, protect this place tonight, God. I pray that you protect the kids upstairs. I pray that you're just with us tonight, Lord. And we'll give you the praise and glory for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're in uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. Like I said, we're going to be talking about following Jesus Christ and what it takes to be a true follower of Jesus. Now, before this, I always kind of like to go through the context and read the context of what was happening before this and what was happening after this to really get a good understanding of what we're talking about and what, this verse is, what these verses are talking about. So before this, and Jesus' ministry before this, he was obviously healing people. Uh, he was teaching his disciples. He just got finished coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration where he uh, came out and with all of his glory and his face was shining. Uh, he was teaching his disciples about mercy. He was teaching his disciples about pride. And then if you look in verse 51, it says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is a huge turning point in Luke's gospel account right here. He steadfastly, Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. What does that mean? Well, it means that he started his journey to go to the cross. This is a huge point, a turning point. He left his main operation in Galilee and he was turning to go to Jerusalem. Why? To go to the cross to die for your sins and to die for my sins. So you might want to ask, okay, so what does this journey look like? What is this journey that he's going to be taking to go to the cross? Well, it looks, it's going to look like this. The journey involves betrayal. It involves Jesus being mocked. And it involves Jesus being ridiculed. It involves him being betrayed by his best friends. To the point where he's exceedingly sorrowful when he's in the garden and he's sweating drops of blood. And he's crying out to the Father. This journey includes being falsely accused. It includes Jesus being whipped, beaten, having his beard pulled out, spit on, to the point where he's taking up his cross on his back, his own death sentence, going up to Calvary, dying on a cross, hanging there, suffering with pierces through his hands and through his feet, and he's suffering there all alone. <coughs> that's, that's this journey. That's the journey that he set his face towards. Steadfastly, which means unwavering, which means that he was committed to it. He was committed to setting his face to Jerusalem to die and to suffer for you and for me. Isn't that awesome? Amen. So here we are. We're in verse 57. Jesus is with the disciples and they're going down this road. So let's pick it up in verse 57 and read the text. It says, Now it happened. And just stop right there. Don't you love when the Bible says, now it happened? You're just like, what's, gonna, what's happening? 
It just gets you like pumped up. All right, sorry, I'll just keep on going. <laughs> now it happens. As they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand on the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So, the message here is about following Jesus. Right? The subject is about following. The first guy said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. The second time, Jesus said, follow me. And the third guy, Lord said, uh, the guy said, I'll follow you wherever you go. So the subject is about following Jesus. It's about the cost of discipleship. It's about the cost of following Jesus. It's about commitment. And that's what Jesus was, was showing right here. Jesus, what he did, if you notice, he challenged each and every one of these guys, these would-be disciples, and he challenged their profession. He challenged the genuineness of it. So it's about following Jesus. Now, involvement and commitment are two different things. Let me try to explain. One author said it like this. The difference between involvement and commitment is like eggs and ham breakfast. The chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. <laughs> There's a difference between involvement and commitment. <laughs> but listen, whenever you, whenever, we could be like, all right, I want to get involved. Or someone might say, and challenge you, to be like, yeah, I want to get involved in something. So you're just like, okay, yeah, 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 I'll get involved. I can do that. I'll involve myself in that. But whenever they tell you to commit to it, we're just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Commitment? No, 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 no. That means I gotta do it all the time. I'm not willing to do that. See, we get scared about the word commitment. A lot of us do. Listen to this verse. John chapter 2, 23 through 24. This is Jesus speaking. It says, now when he was in, or this is uh, John speaking about, about Jesus, it says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them, because he knew all men. See, Jesus said to go and to make disciples throughout all the nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He did not say... Try to get as many people as you can to church so that after your sermon you can raise your hand and say, yeah, I'm saved. He said to make disciples and to commit to making disciples and to making them. And that's what he's looking for. He looks for genuineness rather than enthusiasm. He looks for a genuine profession. Many believing in his name involves more than just up here. It involves more than just the intellect. It involves the heart. See, you can know all your word you can uh, be able to recite scripture. You can know all the right things to do, but if it's not in your heart, it doesn't mean anything. And that's exactly what we see in this passage, right? Jesus challenged the three guys, he challenged of their genuineness, of their profession. And I, I honestly, I believe this day and age, and a lot, because I've only I've, I've only been saved for like two years, and I and I can and I never came from a Christian background before. I'd never read the Bible before. So once I became saved and I could see all these different types of teaching, it really scared me. Because there's a lot of preachers and a lot of churches out here that are teaching the gospel in a way where it's completely watered down. And the reason why is because they're wanting these people to come to church. They're wanting these people to come in, come in, come in, come in, so they can get more money. So when there's more people that are going to be here, they start watering down the gospel because they try to make it more comfortable for the people that are around. See, this message is not a comfortable message. And it's not comfortable for me to really be up here and speaking this message because it's hard. Because it's about suffering and it's about hardship. And no one wants to hear about that, right? 
and it's difficult. But you can't just preach some of the gospel. You've got to preach the whole thing. So, of course, we want blessings in our life, obviously. The best blessing that God's ever given us is when Jesus came to this earth. And he came and he preached and he taught and he healed the lame, he healed the sick. And he made blind eyes see. He made the mute speak. He did all these things and he finally ultimately died on a cross for your sins and for my sins to pick us up from the pit of hell and to give us everlasting life and to give us salvation. That's the best gift that Jesus has ever given us or just God has ever given us ever before. So think about this. We're, we want comfort, especially in America. We look for comfort, right? But look, if you are a true born-again Christian tonight and you're in this building tonight truly born again and you lose everything you ever owned right now, you are blessed. You're blessed because you have salvation. And a lot of people, what they do is that they, just, they start putting the value of other things above their salvation and above Jesus Christ. And they start putting the value of their comfort or their possessions or relationships and they put it above Jesus. See, don't lose the value of how valuable Jesus is. Jesus would be more valuable than anything in this world. Anything. You can think about as much money from this whole entire world, put it all together, and, and Jesus is still more valuable than that. Nothing is more valuable than Jesus Christ. But, many people, they get shocked. And they get shocked when bad things start happening in their life. And they're just like, why, why, why is this going on, right? I'm following Jesus now, so it's really, really difficult. See, many people get shocked whenever they start following Jesus and they realize they have to go through some hurt, they've got to go through some sacrifice, they've got to go through some suffering. And they're just like, whoa, 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 this is what This wasn't what the preacher told me. Well, in the Bible, if you read your Bibles, it says, Jesus never promised us that we were going to be without suffering. In fact, he actually said the exact opposite. He said that we're going to be, we're going to suffer for him. And that's one of the reasons why I believe that people can't, I believe people can't, they don't know how to deal with difficult situations because whenever they get saved and everything's going great, everything's going good, and God's blessing me here, and God's blessing me here, and God's blessing me here. But then whenever something bad happens, they're just like, whoa, why is God doing this? God must not, God must hate me. And they have a wrong view of God because they, bought into this lie that by being obedient to God, that He owes us for our good behavior. It's not true. It's not true. So we have a mindset, most people have a mindset of going into Christianity and saying, what can I get from this? Right? What can I get from becoming a Christian? I guess some water. And uh, that's a totally wrong, wrong way to look at it, first of all. Here's the truth. There's going to be times in your life where it's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard. There's going to be times where you're not, you don't understand why God's doing what He's doing. There's going to be times where you don't feel like God is with you. There's going to be times where it's going to be hard. And whenever this, these times in our life come up, the people that were taught about how God's just going to give you blessings and He's going to give you wealth and health and prosperity and all these things, what do they end up doing? They quit. They quit on God. Because they had the wrong view of who God was from the very beginning. So our mindset shouldn't be, what can I get from this? It should be, what more can I sacrifice for Jesus? Look what He did for me. Look, look at the salvation that He's brought me. What more can I do for Him? What areas in my life do I need to commit more to Him? Right? It should be, what can I get? Be, what can I give? So are we asking those type of questions? Honestly, like in a day-in, day-out basis, are we really, truly asking those types of questions? 
If we are really, truly reading the word, believing what Jesus says, are we asking, what more can I do for the kingdom of God? <laughs> Martin Luther said this, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing, is worth nothing. See, we want to put conditions on following Jesus. We say, hey, if I get a new car, I'll follow Jesus. If God puts my family back together, I'll go ahead and follow Jesus. If God gives me a new house, I'll follow him. If he just gives me all these blessings, yeah, I'll follow him. These are the type of people that want to like, come in, they want to be identified with Jesus, but they have, a, they have no commitment to him. And they come in and they want to be thrilled, they want to be entertained, but they don't really want to be changed, and they don't really want to be saved. Right? So they come in here... And they, want to, they, they like the music, they get thrilled by the music, but they don't want a real change because they don't want to go through the sacrifice. Think about, think about the disciples. They gave it all. They gave it all in one. Luke 9.23 says this, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And follow him. So like I said, the value of Jesus should be more valuable than anything in this life. You say, please, you live out front. What about my friends? Yeah. More valuable than your friends. <coughs> what about my family, my kids? Yeah, Jesus should be more valuable than your family and kids. My relationships, my possessions, my finances. Jesus should be more valuable than that. So, this is what these verses show us. Jesus is showing us how, what, it, what it means and what it takes to truly be a disciple. He gives us three challenges that we must be willing to give up to become a truly committed follower of Jesus Christ. Number one, we must be willing to give up our comfort. If you look at verse 57, it says, Now it happened. As they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. At first, you might think, wow, that sounds like a sold out Christian right there, right? Lord, I will follow you wherever you go, right? I mean, that's what you want to hear. It's like, who, who in the world is this guy? I'll follow you wherever you go. In Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, it actually shows us who this guy really is. And this guy is a scribe. A scribe is someone who studied the law and knew it like the back of their hand. They would rewrite, they would write the Bible out, rewrite it again. And hey, they would be able to quote scripture blindfolded. They knew their word. Let me tell you something though. Someone very involved in church who knows and says all the right things is not always a Christian. It doesn't matter if you guys come here to Freeway every Saturday night and go to church on Sunday, go to men's group on Monday, go to church on Wednesday, go to prayer group on Wednesday night, go to Bible study on Thursday. If you're not doing it for God, trying to be giving Him glory, then it doesn't mean anything. You can fool everyone. You can fool your pastor. You can fool the preacher. You can come up here and have some false sense of faith and, just, and cry out on the altar. It could be an emotional thing. But if it's not in the heart, it doesn't mean anything. Jesus knew, he knows our hearts. He knew the intentions of this scribe's heart. That's why, he, that's why he answered the way he answered. Listen to what it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesus knew this scribe couldn't be a true disciple. Because look how he responds. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Remember to what, what, he, what he said before. He set his face to Jerusalem. He's saying, you have no idea where I'm going. You seriously want to follow me? That might leave you homeless. You, you want to go all the way? You want to go all in? And this is actually, like I said, he's, he's testing and challenging the genuineness of the scribe's profession. 
And he's asking a really, really good question that we need to be asking ourselves. If Jesus points somewhere that's really, really uncomfortable, are we willing to go there? If Jesus asked you to go witness to your neighbor that you've never, ever talked to before, but you've felt it in your heart that you should go witness to him, will you go there? If Jesus asked you to become a missionary to like the Amazon or something crazy like that where you know it's just real, real, real scary, right? And there's snakes and spiders, big spiders, big snakes, spiders and snakes, would you go there? If Jesus asked you to go preach the gospel for hundreds of people, would you go there? I thought about this one. If Jesus asked you to go witness to a member of ISIS, would you do it? See, impressive words are easy to make, but biblical Christianity is not about our comfort. Look at this verse. Luke 10, 3. So right, right over, the, right over the down. It says, Go your way, behold, I send you out as lamb, as, a, as lambs among wolves. That's not a call for comfort. Lambs among wolves, that does not sound good. So let me ask you guys, are you willing to choose, are you going to choose comfort, or are you going to choose the cross? Like, if you, do you realize, like, if what we're doing right now, now we're, we're, we're hearing the word of God, we're all here as a group, do you realize what would happen if we were doing this in a different country? Do you realize what some people have to go through in different countries just to read the Bible? Like, people in China, they have to go and, uh, at different times in the morning so they won't get caught. And they go to this underground place. And that's where they read the Bible. They can't just open it up and read it like we have the freedom to do here. You realize that some people, when they profess that they're a Christian, that could mean losing their life. You know what happens in some countries? When people start speaking the word of God and they get caught for doing it, they'll cut their tongue out. Seriously. And what do we do? We say, ah, I don't want to. I don't want to go. I don't want to go witness to this guy because I'm scared of what he might think of me. All right, I'm guilty of that, by the way. So I'm not harping on you guys. I'm. This is a. This is a message for myself, as much as it is for anyone else. I'm guilty of that. And that's convicting. There's people that are willing to lose their life and <laughs> lay it all out on the line. And I'm too scared. I'm worried about what someone else is going to say to me for witnessing to them. See, Jesus isn't looking for an emotional profession. And when things die off, when things get difficult, then you're just done. And you fall off. Jesus is looking for a sold out, committed, faithful people that are willing to go all in, 100%, wholehearted, all in for Jesus Christ. No matter what the cost, he's looking for committed people to be faithful and saying, no matter what I go through, no matter what suffering I go through, I am following you and I am faithful to you and I'm going to be committed to you 100% and I'm in. Can you guys say that tonight? 100%. I am, I am completely all in for Jesus. So what are you committed to tonight? Are you committed to that or are you committed to something else? When I first came to Freeway, uh, you guys will probably remember uh, Grant and Anna that were up here. They were the worship leaders. They had an awesome ministry. And... Uh, they were committed. They were all in. I remember one night, I was at a Wednesday night prayer group after Crossway, and I asked Graham, I said, how do you feel right now? Because he was about to leave. And he's like, well, he's like, I sat, in, I slept on a mattress last night that wasn't mine in a house that was already sold. He's just like, it was really, really surreal. I'm going to be going from China. <coughs> See? They left everything. They gave it all. They had no idea about China, but they knew God's call. They knew that God was calling them to go there and be missionaries. They left it all on the line for them. They are an awesome example. 
So that's the first thing. You know, we're so quick to jump on the Jesus train when everything's going good, but when things get really tough, where Christianity becomes demanding, we want to just jump off right away. So we must be willing to give up our comfort, number one. Secondly, we must be willing to give up our possessions. Look what it says in verse 59. It says, Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. So, okay. That seems like a pretty reasonable and honorable thing, right? I'm gonna go, I want to go bury my father first before I go follow you. And Scripture teaches us to honor our fathers and our, and, our, and our mothers. Scripture also teaches us to obey our parents. And it was the son's duty to make sure that his father had a proper burial. So these are all good things, right? I want to go bury my father first, and then I'll go follow you. Okay, like if it was me, I'd be like, dude, go. Go. Be with your family. Right? Do what you got to do. We gotta, we gotta realize what was more important to this man. The phrase "bury my father" was a term back in ancient days that says this. It was a common phrase used back then that meant staying at home, fulfilling the family's responsibilities until the father has died and they received his share of the inheritance. See, this guy's his focus wasn't on Jesus. His focus was on his possessions. His focus was on money. His focus was on his inheritance for his father. So you think about what he must have been thinking. I want to get the inheritance from my father. Once I am comfortable, once I have all the finances and I'm financially comfortable, then I'll go follow Jesus. But again, Jesus knew the intentions of this guy's heart. Look how he responds in verse 60. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you... Go and preach the kingdom of God. He said, let the dead bury their own dead. Doesn't that seem kind of harsh? Right? It's just like, let the dead bury their own dead. Whoa. But what he was meaning, he is letting, he's saying, let the spiritually dead bury the dead. In other words, let the world take care of the things of this world. You have a more important calling that, I, that you are you being used to fulfill the kingdom of God. I'm giving you a calling to go preach the word, which supersedes anything else in this world. You go and do that. And that's what Jesus was saying. He had a bigger and better calling. See, the problem is also, Jesus knew that if this guy was to go back to his house and go back to his family, that he would never come back anyway. He, like I said, he knew the intentions of this guy's heart. If he was to go back, he would never come back. So the Bible says, we need to check our priorities, right? The Bible says that we should seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not second, not third, not fourth. We seek God first. The thing that really blew me away about this when I was studying it is that this man was called Jesus spoke to him and called him to preach the gospel. And what did he do? He delayed it. He delayed it and he made an excuse. <clears throat> there might be some of you guys in here tonight that you know that Jesus is calling you. And you know that you're hearing the word of God and it's penetrating your heart. And you know that you're, you're being called to preach the gospel or to become a missionary or to become a Sunday school teacher or to come, have some more commitment in your life to Jesus. And you know that he's calling you out. And you're delaying it. And you're making an excuse for it. And you know he's calling you. Be obedient to God's call no matter what. We have no idea when our last days are, right? We, we have no idea even about tonight. We can leave tonight. We have no idea when God's going to call us to come home. We don't even know it's our last breath. God gives us every single breath. We have no clue, all right? So if you know that God's calling you, don't delay. He's telling you right in this verse, there's so much urgency in Jesus right here where he's saying, no, 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 no. You don't go bury your father. You go and preach the word of God. 
You obey the calling that I've given you. There's so much urgency about preaching the word that we should take that as, as seriousness and be like, okay, I'm going to listen to whatever God says. He's telling you don't wait. He's telling you don't delay. If you hear God calling you, you respond tonight, and you respond and don't delay it. Because you don't know when the last time that we're going to have to come back here and listen to the Word of God. This could be the last time that some of you guys will hear the Word of God. We have no clue. So if God is calling us, if God is speaking to us, we obey Him. It's a sense of urgency. Alright, so... It's like, alright, when's this, when's this going to be over? This is, it's all about terrible stuff. But hey, so, like I said, number one, he's willing, he's, he's calling us to be willing to give up our comfort. He's calling us to be willing to give up our possessions. He's calling us, thirdly, to be willing to give up our relationships. Look what he says in verse 61. Said, and another said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. So again, this sounds like a pretty reasonable request, right? I want to go say bye to my parents first. I want to go say bye to the people at my house first. Then I'll go follow you. Alright? But again, with this third man, just like the second and the first, Jesus knew the intentions of this guy's heart. Jesus knew exactly what he was feeling inside. In verse 62, Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Let me read that again. No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus knew there was something deeper in his requests. Jesus knew that he had ties back to his old life, back to his family, back to his friends, that he couldn't drop. Jesus knew the intentions of his heart. He knew that his friends and family were more important to him than the value of what Jesus was. Just like the first man putting his comfort over Jesus, the second man putting his possessions over Jesus, this third man is putting his relationships over him. And the people that, and it's hard, right? Because you, I mean, your family, you love your family, your family loves you. But if Jesus calls you, are you willing to go? Are you willing to just let it all go? Because if you are, you got to understand that if you are willing to follow Jesus, he's going to take care of them. He's going to take care of everything else. He's, he's waiting for you just to obey his call. Whenever you become a Christian, sooner or later, God's going to give you a test. And he's going to give you two options. Number one, follow. Or the other option is to deny him. He's going to give you a choice. Matthew 10, 33 says, But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. See, when you get saved, your old nature, the old things pass away. Behold, all things become new, right? When you get saved, you're going to have new desires. You're going to want to be around new people. You're going to want to be around Christians. You're going to, you're going to want to go to church. You're going to be hungry for the Word of God. You're going to be different. I remember my first real big test whenever I became a Christian. And before I got saved, I was running around with a group of people uh, doing drugs, selling drugs, taking pills, partying. I was doing all that stuff. And I was around this group of people. And I lived with them. I thought they were my brothers. I thought that they really cared for me. And one of my buddies got married. Well, he got me proposed. So, guess who had to go to the wedding? Guess who was a groomsman at his wedding? Me. And what, is the, what do the groomsmen do, right? The groomsmen, the groomsmen at his wedding were all the same guys that I hung out with. Were all the same guys that I sold drugs with. 
And we had to go to a bachelor party. So I'm this new Christian. Just got saved. I know this is a big deal. I try to justify it in my head because I'm thinking to myself, what are they going to think if I say no? What are they going to think of me? They're not going to be my friends anymore. What are, what are, what are they going to, what they, what's their view of me going to be if I say I can't go? So I try to justify it. And this is what I thought, which is ridiculous. I thought, well, I'm going to go down there. What we're doing is we're going to go on a fishing trip in, in uh, Arkansas. I knew there was going to be drinking. I knew there was going to be smoking. I knew all that was going to happen. But I thought, because I'm a Christian, I'll go down there and show them. I'll go down there and show them how strong I am in my faith. And I won't do anything. I won't drink. I won't smoke. I won't do any of that. Yeah, right. And this is the crazy thing is because I remember I was teaching, by the way, Thursday night Bible study. And I made a decision that I'm going to go do that. And I went to Thursday night Bible study. And... We have like this normal thing and you can go around the Bible study and say, give something that you're, you're thankful for, give a praise request. And I remember Casey, you were there that night. A guy named Ernest was there. And I'm so thankful for you guys and everyone there because that's one of my prayer requests was, you know, pray for me this weekend because I'm going to go down here and scratch the party and there's going to be party and blah, 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 blah. And I got like rebuked that night. <laughs> but I'm so thankful for the godly men that were there that were able to show me and teach me, hey, here's scripture. This is what scripture says, right? This is, this is what the word of God says. And at the end of the night, this is what they said to me. They said, you got to make a decision. And that night, I made a decision just to not go. And I told my friends, and it's like, I'm sorry, I can't make it to the bachelor party because I'm standing on the word of God. And I'm standing on what I believe. I made a choice to go follow Jesus that night. And I had so much joy and so much peace in my heart for doing that. When the months before that I was praying about it, I was miserable because I knew it was the wrong thing to do. But I made a choice that I was going to follow Jesus no matter what. And my friends did not like that. A lot of them were just like, I thought you were my brothers. I thought you were my brother. But hey, Jesus calls us to be separate. Jesus. Jesus said, no one, having put his hand on the plow and looking back to spread for the kingdom of God, can't keep going forward if you're always looking back. 2 right. Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18 say this, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you should be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This man, this third guy, had to make a decision. See, he had his friends, his family, uh, all the people he grew up with, over here. And then over here, he's got Jesus Christ. And he's stuck in the middle. And he's trying to hold on to both. There might be some of you guys right now in this room that are in this position right now. And Jesus was saying, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision and choose. You can't have both. You're either going to be all in or you're going to be all out. Some of you might be in a position of that. It's all or nothing. Revelation 3.16, Jesus said this, I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's some pretty big words. Jesus wants us to be all in or all out. And if he's calling us, then we want to, we, we got to be all in for him. It makes him sick when we're lukewarm. To the point he wants to spit us out. Listen to the seriousness of that verse. That's a big deal. So tonight, make a commitment to God tonight. Say, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what my family says. I don't care what my friends say. I am going to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. I'm moving forward. I'm not looking back. And I'm going to be all in. Make a commitment to Jesus Christ tonight. And that can, be, that can mean a lot of different things. Make, if you're struggling in your prayer life, make a commitment to prayer. Make a commitment to witnessing. To talking to people about Jesus at your job. Make a commitment to reading the Bible daily. To dying to yourself daily. To picking up your cross daily. 
I believe there's a lot of people in here tonight that are like <laughs> two-stepping. You know? That are like have one foot in church and one foot in the world, and they're trying to make a decision, and they're just straddling it right here. Jesus is calling you to be all in. Make a commitment to him tonight. Take a risk. Take a risk with your time. Take a risk with your money. Take a risk for Jesus Christ. That's what he's calling in this, in, these, in, these, in this passage right here. This is the true cost of discipleship. When you get saved, see, there's a difference between getting saved and following Jesus. See, we're not saved because we take up a cross and follow Jesus. We're saved because we believe and we trust in the Savior that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But whenever we become children of God, then we become disciples. So whenever we become children of God, then we follow Him and we give up everything to take up our cross and follow Him. Because we want to. Because we want to give to Him. Right? So there's a difference between discipleship and sonship. It's like, discipleship is not a requirement of salvation as much as it is a proof. So, whenever you get saved, if you are a true, born-again Christian... You are going to follow Jesus no matter what the cost is. And if that's not you tonight, then maybe that's something you need to get right tonight. Because Jesus is going to be coming back soon. That's right. That's right. Amen? Amen. <laughs> he's going to be coming back soon. But here's the thing. He's not going to be coming as a savior. He's going to be coming as a judge. Hallelujah. And he's going to be coming as a warrior that's going to bust out of the clouds. Right? He's going to be on a white stallion with his robe dripped in blood of his enemies. And he's going to have a sword coming out of his mouth because he's going to judge the world. That's right. That's, what he, that's what's going to happen. Some of you guys need to make peace with that God tonight. Some of you guys, that's the God that, that is calling you to commitment. That's the God that is calling you to follow him. Is that God. We serve an awesome God. And he is powerful. Oh. That's going to be crazy. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to close up here. I'm going to give you guys five questions to think about. Okay? Number one, are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing some of your closest friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means alienation from your family? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means the loss of your reputation? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your life? Are you willing to go all in for him tonight? See, following Jesus doesn't mean that all these things will necessarily happen. But are you willing to take up your cross? And you might say, there's a lot of suffering right there. Listen, listen to this verse. Romans 8.18 For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. See, we could, like Jesus, when he set his face to Jerusalem, he looked past all the suffering and he looked towards the glory. Just like we need to do. We can look past all the suffering in this, in this, this present time, this momentary affliction. We can look past that and look at the glory which is going to be revealed to us. It says that it's not even worthy to be compared to. That's why we give our lives to Jesus. That's why we follow Him with everything that we have. So if there comes a point in your life where you're faced with a decision, with the comforts of this world, or following Jesus Christ, which one are you guys going to choose? Let's pray. God, I thank you, God, just for, for Jesus. I thank you for his sacrifice, that he was the perfect sacrifice. He was sufficient for us all. That he died on the cross for our sins. That he rose the third day. And we, I put my trust and faith in that. I am so thankful for salvation, God. Help me, help these people here tonight to realize the value of what that means realize the true value of what you bring to us. God, don't allow us to put all these other things and all these uh, 
our comforts of this life, maybe our possessions, don't allow us to put that above you. God, I know that there's someone in here that is hurting that needed to hear this message. I know, God, there's people that need to commit to you tonight. I pray that, God, you give them the freedom to do that. And I pray, God, that you will be with the next, uh, be with Jeremy as he's preaching. And continue with your spirit in here, Lord. I pray that there's people that are being saved, but only your spirit can do that by convicting them of their sin. So I pray, Lord, that people will be on the altars tonight. I pray for salvation. And I pray for this group in here that we will be committed 100% wholehearted followers of you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're taking 15.